this morning? Yes. Does your soul say yes this morning? Amen. We thank God for another opportunity he's given us to wake up to see a new day. Yes. As the old deacon in my church used to say, with the blood running warm in our veins. Yes. And we just thank God for every opportunity he gives us to come together as one body in Christ. Amen. I'm not going to hold you long this morning, but I, on this Martin Luther King Day, I think it's important for us to acknowledge. We always acknowledge what God has done, but we, in the Bible and in the Word, but we also have to acknowledge what God has done through people in history, because God works through individuals in history. And that's why we need to make sure that we avail ourselves to God, because you don't know what God wants to do with you in the world. That's why every time we come to this place, we ought to keep our ears open to what, what thus saith the Lord and, and what difference we can make. And I'm not saying that you have to make this big, grandiloquent kind of contribution, but I'm saying something little might make a difference in somebody's life. Amen? Amen. So let's turn to the word of God. Second Kings, the sixth chapter verses 8 to 23. That's Second Kings, not first, but second. Second Kings, the sixth chapter, beginning with verse 8 and ending with verse 23. One more time, that's Second Kings, the sixth chapter beginning with verse 8 and ending with verse 23. And in the King James Version, we hear these words. Then the king of Syria warred against Israel and took counsel with his servants, saying, In such and such a place shall be my camp. And the man of God sent unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware that thou pass not such a place, for thither the Syrians are come down. And the king of Israel sent to the place which the man of God told him and warned him of, and saved himself there, not once nor twice. Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was sore troubled for this thing. And he called his servants and said unto them, Will ye not show me which one is for the king of Israel? And one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha. Elisha the prophet that is in Israel, tell the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy bedchamber. And he said, go and spy where he is, that I may send and fetch him. And it was told him, saying, behold, he is in Dothan. Therefore, send he thither horses and chariots and a great host. And they came by night and compassed the city about. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, an host compassed the city, both with horses and chariots. And his master said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall, how shall we do? And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw that, behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. Mm -hmm. And when they came down to him, Elisha prayed unto the Lord and said, Smite this people, I pray thee, with blindness. And they smote them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. And Elisha said unto them, This is not the way, neither is this the city. Follow me, and I will bring you to the man whom ye seek. But he led them to Samaria. And it came to pass when they were come to Samaria that Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men, and that they might see. And the Lord opened their eyes, and they saw, and behold, they were in the midst of Samaria. And the king of Israel said unto Elisha, when he saw them, my father, shall I smite them? Shall I smite them? 
And he answered, Thou shalt not smite them. Wouldst not smite those whom thou hast taken captive with thy bow and with thy staff, sword and with thy bow? Set bread and water before them, that they may eat and drink and go to their master. And he prepared great provision for them. And when they had eaten and drunk, he sent them away. They went to their master. So the bands of Syria came no more into the land of Israel. I want to preach from the topic, the praying prophet. The praying prophet. Amen. You're going to pray with me? Amen. Let us, let us pray together. Almighty and eternal God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your darling son Jesus who died on the cross for our sins, Lord. We thank you that he made possible the gathering together of us who constitute the body of Christ. We thank you, God, for your word. We thank you, God, for your people. And now we ask, Lord, that you would open our hearts and open our minds that we might receive with us saved the Lord. For we trust and ask this in the mighty, matchless, and majestic name of your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Elisha. Sha, not Ja, not Elijah, but Elisha. Elisha, the younger protege of Elijah. So Elisha finds himself in this passage between two kings, the king of Israel and the king of Syria. The king of Syria started war with the king of Israel. The king of Israel was not able to really defeat the king of Syria. So it was a real threat to the national security of the nation. This, was, this enemy was really elusive, and, and the king of Syria came and counseled with his officers about where to set up his camp. When, you're, when you have the victory, when things are going well with you, you can put out plans, and, and you can say what you're going to do and when you're going to do it. And I believe that the, the king of Syria was pretty confident, pretty cocky about the situation because he realized that the king of Israel could not defeat him. But enter the prophet. There's always a word from the Lord in the midst of conflict. Amen? Amen. And so the prophet ran interference between the king of Syria and the king of Israel. The prophet Elijah sent word to the king of Israel. And the king was probably demoralized at this time, despairing, disappointed with his lack of military success against the king of Syria. But Elijah sent word not to pass a specific place that they were planning to go because the Syrians were there setting up camp. So the prophet warned the king of Israel. Sometimes God sends us a warning but we don't listen to what God is saying to us. And so when we get in difficult situations, we cry out, Lord, Lord, why am I going through this? Lord, Lord, why am I buffeted at every side? Lord, Lord, why is Satan attacking me? Because we did not listen to what God has to say. There's always a word from the Lord. And God, through Elisha, sent word to the king of Israel, not to go to the certain place because the king of Syria was there. And so the king of Israel sent word to that place that Elijah told him about. So the king of Syria was frustrated because it's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm making plans, but it seems like the king of Israel knows my plans. What's going on here? And so the king of Syria was frustrated <laughs> and he said, who, uh, the king of Syria, who had frustrated the king of Israel, was now frustrated himself. The king was upset, and he turned to his own officers and said, look, somebody's spying it out. Whose side are you on, my side or the king of Israel? Who's the snitch? Who's the betrayer? Who's the double agent among us? And you know, some, sometimes we feel insecure, don't we? When things aren't going right, we're like, okay, what's going on? But you know something? When you're doing the right thing, you don't have to find out what's going on. You don't have to look around. And God has a way of, of, of getting with us when we don't do what God has called us to do. Amen? And, and the problem was not in Syria. 
One of his officers said, the problem is not among us. We're loyal to you. But there is some cat by the name of Elisha. Elijah, he's the one. He's the prophet in Israel who, who tells the king of Israel what we're doing. The prophet seems to be in your bedchambers when you make your plans. The prophet, the troublemaker. The prophet should always be a troublemaker. The problem when the prophet talks about things that people in power talk about, you're no longer a prophet. The prophet is the one who speaks the word of God. The Hebrew word for prophet is navi, one who is a mouthpiece for God. If you're a mouthpiece for God, then you cannot be a mouthpiece for oppression. That's why Dr. King, of all the things, he was a prophet. A prophet not because he looked in the future down the road, but he was a prophet because he spoke the word of God. And when you speak the word of God, then the future unravels to you. And so Dr. King was a troublemaker. And I know tomorrow people are going to say, oh, Dr. King was a great speaker, and Dr. King went to black, white together, and Dr. King, all these things. But Dr. King was really a troublemaker. But what we try to do is we try to um, domesticate him so that his message is comfortable for us. But Dr. King would not be domesticated. Dr. King spoke a word that got him in trouble. And Elijah is the same way he was a prophet who spoke the word of God and speaking the word of God got him in trouble. The king of Syria's plans were upended because Elisha kept seeing his plans and alerting the king of Israel. The king of Syria sent an order to find this guy. Usually when you're upsetting folk in power, they want to get rid of you. You cannot hold on to power and also have a prophetic voice that is challenging you. That's why you could not have Dr. King speaking truth to power. Think about it. In 1964 and 1965, there was major legislation that was passed. And the president of the United States, Lyndon Johnson at the time, was like, Dr. King, we are here to help you push this legislation. And a matter of fact, Lyndon Johnson was very key in pushing the legislation through the Congress. But when Dr. King said, OK, my vision is not just limited to to uh, uh, black and white together and fighting segregation, but my vision is much bigger. We need to look at what it means to be global citizens. And so when Dr. King spoke out against war, nobody supported Dr. King. Matter of fact, when he spoke out against war, people went by the wayside with him, both black and white, newspapers and all of his support. And so at the end of his life, Dr. King stood alone by himself. But Dr. King said, I don't care about what people think. God has called me to speak the truth. And God spoke the truth and, through Dr. King. And, and I believe when you look at 1966 to 1968, I think there's some of the best years of Dr. King. Because Dr. King was free to articulate. They said, Dr. King, even his own organization that he established with his own money, said, Dr. King, religion and politics don't mix. Don't talk about the war. You just got major legislation passed. You just got victory in Congress. Why are you going to worry about that? Because the prophet of God doesn't care about opinions. The prophet of God is only concerned with doing what God calls them to do. So the king of Syria sent orders to make sure that Elijah gets shut up. And it was discovered his hiding place that he was at Dothan. And the king sent horses and chariots and a great army to make sure you find this guy. They came by night and surrounded the place where the prophet was. You know, the enemy always comes at night when you're asleep. The enemy always comes when you're unaware. That's why we always have to be alert. We cannot be, okay, let me leave that alone. <laughs> and as the morning broke, Elijah had a servant. And the servant went out 
because the enemy came at night. The servant went out during the morning and he looked around and he saw the horses. He saw the chariots and he saw the army that surrounded the city. There was no way in and there was no way out. It was a show of power and it was a show of strength. And when you feel surrounded, you feel vulnerable. When you feel surrounded, you feel powerless. When you feel surrounded, you feel hopeless and confused and, and fearful. But, but, but in those times, we need, again, a word from God. And the servant of Elijah said, oh, my Lord, I just went out to wash my face. And I looked around, and I saw chariots, and I saw horses, and I saw a great army. What are we going to do? And what does Elijah tell him? Elijah says, don't be afraid. And if I was Elijah's servant, I'd be like, what? Don't you see what's out there? Don't you see what's going on? That there are horses and chariots and, and there's an army waiting to get you. Waiting to take you because you're a big troublemaker. And most of us would be like, I, I got a double finger while I'm hanging around you. Because, you know, I thought this thing would be a little better than it is, but... But, you know, if you go down, I don't want to go down with you. But you know something? The prophet says, calm down. Calm down. Because I know that in life there's difficulty. Calm down. I know in life there's despair. Calm down. I know in life there are situations that you think you can't handle. But calm down. Do not be afraid. And that's what we as God's people, because we are God's people, in the midst of confusion and chaos and trouble and trials and tribulation, we can say, we're not afraid. Amen. And that's what those black folk in Alabama said. We are not afraid. Aren't you afraid? They got dogs and fire hoses and the laws against you. Aren't you afraid? And they said, no, we're not afraid. And when people get together of goodwill, black people and white people join together to fight a evil like segregation without guns, without knives, without violence, you see what happens. And so Elijah says, don't be afraid. I know we feel vulnerable. I know we feel powerless. I know it seems hopeless, but don't be afraid. And so Elijah says, well, what are we going to do then? <laughs> Okay, that's big talk. You, we're not, what are we going to do? The project in a frightful situation says, do not be afraid. For there are more with us Amen. than with them. And basically, it's like, it's only me and you. What are you talking about? But the prophet says, let me pray. Because that's what we have. Let me pray for you, servant. Because you need to understand, you need to see the situation in a different way. And we as God's people, we see situations and circumstances in a different way. We don't see things after the flesh like the world does. We see things after the spirit. And the spirit shows us something that the world cannot see. The world is dependent on their might and their power and their strength. And, and the king of Syria was dependent on his might and his power and his strength. And he thought he could go in the dozing and just snatch up Elijah and bring him back. But Elisha said, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be a realist. I know you think I'm crazy. I know we're surrounded. But Elijah, in the midst of that situation, prayed. And in the middle of a bad situation, we always pray, don't we? We need to see beyond the current situation. Prayer always takes us to another place so that we can come back and deal with the situation in this place. Elijah prayed for his servant. And the prayer was concerned with the servant. Most of the time when we pray, we pray for ourselves. Lord, bless me. Lord, bless me. Lord, give me this. Give me this. Give me this. But Elijah's prayer was for his servant. And my prayer as a pastor is for Bethel Baptist Church. And his prayer was that his servant's eyes would be open, that, that he would see what, what, what he sees, that he wouldn't see sir, uh, 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 chariots, and, and he wouldn't see horses, and, and he wouldn't see a grand army, but he would see that, that God is in the midst, that God is present. 
that, that, that we are majority because God is with us. I know you're looking around and you're fearful, but look around again. Look around and let God give you vision. And so he said, I looked around again and I saw that Elijah, the man of God, was surrounded with flaming horses, flaming chariots. Go ahead, and he said, don't have to fear. We need to see our circumstances in a spiritual way. We need to see with God's help. Yes. And we don't see right. That's the problem. We don't see what God wants to do for us. We don't see what God has in store for us. And so we live life mundane and regular, but we don't see what God wants for us. When I wake up in the morning, I can't see clearly because I ain't got my glasses on. And I believe sometimes my wife hired them just to play with me. I was like, you know, you wake up and like, oh my God, I can't see nothing. And only can I see clearly when I have the assistance of my glasses. So we need to stop looking at our problems. And we need to start looking. We had to stop looking at the same old things. And we need to look in a way that is clear for us. Amen. We need to, I need to put my glasses on so I can see clearly. I need some assistance to see clearly. Yeah. And we as God's people need God's assistance so that we can see clearly. Amen? Yeah. Elijah's servant. Saw the horse in the chariot of fire all around him. The eyes of faith know how close God is. And we walk by faith, Paul says, and we walk by sight. That's why Elijah wasn't afraid. When the Syrians came down to get Elijah, Elijah prayed again. There's something about prayer. There's something about prayer that changes things. There's something about prayer that changes situations. There's something about prayer where there's power in there. Amen? Don't you know the power of prayer? Don't you know that there was somebody praying for you and you were in the hospital and God touched the body and raised you up? Remember there was a situation where you were going through and you didn't know what was going to happen, but God touched the situation and raised you up. There's power in prayer. We don't have a lot of money. We don't have a lot of things, but we do have the power that's in prayer. They said, what you going to do? I'm going to pray. Pray. You see those horses out there? Pray. You see those chariots out there? Pray. You see that army out there? Yes, I'm going to pray. Because to the world, prayer sounds foolish. Sounded foolish to the segregationists in Alabama, too. What you going to do, Dr. King, in the civil rights movement? We're going to pray and sing songs. Right, right. Y'all go on to pray. Y'all go on to sing songs. Because it's not going to matter. Because we got the fire hoses, the dogs, and the law. But you know something, in situations where you interject God, all those things don't matter because the battle is the Lord's. The battle is not yours. The battle belongs to the Lord. And the Syrians came down wolfing. And Elijah prayed that the Lord would strike them blind. And the Lord did it. And God will cause confusion with the plans of the enemy. That's why you don't need to worry about getting revenge on your enemy. You don't have to worry about seeking revenge on somebody because God will always take care of the situation. Amen. God is calling you to be loving. God is calling you to be forgiving. God is calling you to do those things that are pleasing for him. The, the Syrians thought they were in control of the situation. But instead of capturing Elijah, the Syrian army was captured by Elijah. That's what God does if you give him time to address the situation. Yes, Elijah said that the blinded army was blind. They didn't know what to do. And so while they were blinded, Elijah said, oh, y'all in the wrong place. Oh, y'all, y'all, no, Elijah ain't here. He need to follow me. Come this way. Come on, come this way. Right. And so the, army, the whole army, the whole army, he didn't have a gun on him. Followed him blindly until he led them right into Samaria where the king of Israel was. Right into their hands. Yeah. And Elijah prayed once they got to Samaria that their eyes would open up. So can you imagine thinking that you're at the place where you're supposed to be 
He imagined that when you open your eyes, you'll see Elijah. He imagined when you open your eyes, you'll be in Dothan. And so, again, the power of prayer. Elijah said, all right, Lord, open up their eyes. And their eyes are open. It's like, uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> we find ourselves in Samaria. And the king of Israel said, we got him now. We got him now. And like you've been avoiding us for such a long time, now we can get you. But instead of destroying the enemy, because the king was eager to destroy the enemy. But the king didn't work to get the enemy. The king didn't do anything to bring the enemy to him. Because it was about God. Amen. And instead of destroying the enemy, Elijah extends hospitality to the enemy. Okay. He tells the king of Israel to not to destroy them, but to set food and drink before them yes. so they can go back to their master. And so they prepared a great feast and sent them on their way. To make an impact on the world, we have to behave in a way that is not ordinary. Our behavior has to be different. It seems to me that when we look at the Old Testament, we always see the battles. We always see people killing each other. But here in this story, we see the prophet praying and the Lord answering the prayer of the prophet. And the prophet extends grace to his enemies. Doesn't that remind you of somebody? Amen. We're going to commemorate Dr. King. And he extended grace. The, the power of Dr. King's ministry is that he saw everybody created in the image of God. He saw everybody as worth of dig, worthy of dignity and, 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 and a legacy of, 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 of respect. He saw everybody as a child of God. He always wanted to redeem those, even those who opposed him. And so Dr. King... Dr. King said, we have to do this differently. We have to do things in an unordinary way. And so we're going to use tactics that the world doesn't understand. We're going to use song. We're going to use marching. And we're going to use prayer. And Lord knows, we know the effect of prayer. The effect of prayer that affected this nation. The effect of prayer that joined people together, the effect of prayer that have political and economic ramifications for a whole nation. Can you imagine a whole army, a whole army turned around? Why? Because instead of killing them, you gave them drink. Instead of killing them, you gave them food. Instead of destroying them, you put a feast right in front of them. And you know, Paul says it in the New Testament. He said, if your enemy is hungry, give him some food. If your enemy is thirsty, give him some drink. And you know something? For us, we need that grace too. Because the Bible says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. We think that we were, in the, we were never in the clutches of sin. We think that we were born and raised in a church and everything was always all right. But that is not the case. Somebody was praying for us. Yes. Somebody was praying for us. We were out there in the world doing everything that we were big enough to do. Somebody was out there that extended hope to us. And, and when we were blinded by sin, somebody said, Lord, bring him in before it's everlasting too late. Yes. We are blinded when we say we know what we're doing. We're blinded when we think that everything is all right because we're in control. But God says that you are blinded to yourself. You need to understand that God wants to use you. You need to understand that, that you need to put forth compassion and love for your enemies. The result of this act of grace was that the Syrian army left them. And the word says, so the bands of Syria came no more into the land of Israel. What a great reversal. What a great reversal. We came to get Elijah. We came to bring Elijah back to the king of Syria. We thought we had Elijah, but Elijah turned the tables on us, and so Elijah got us. And when we opened our eyes in Samaria, we thought, uh-oh, we're going to lose our lives. But the prophet of God said, open up their eyes so they can see that we're not barbaric, but we are in fact a gracious people. And God has called us, especially during this time, 
especially during this age, especially during this administration, God has called us to be compassionate. God has called us to be good. God has called us to go beyond just being nice, but that we are called to love our enemies. We need to be a prophetic voice. You know, prophecy goes more than just not drinking, not smoking, not cussing. If the prophet went to Washington, D.C., I don't think Donald Trump drinks. Uh, I don't think Donald Trump smokes. Uh, well, he cusses sometimes. <laughs> but if a prophet went to Washington, D.C., what would he say to the President of the United States? He would pray that God would open his eyes Amen. to what is needed. He would pray that God would open his eyes and he would challenge him on some of the policies that he has. That's why we as the black church, we have to recover our tradition of black prophetic speaking. I know this is not a, pre a shouting sermon, but it's an important sermon because God has called us to make a difference in this world. If we fail to do that, then there will be other institutions and other entities that will do it for us and we will be left behind. So we need to be a praying church, just like Elisha was a praying prophet. And, and once we understand the power of prayer, we will see how God can reverse the things in our lives. God is a reverser. He used to drink, he can reverse it. He used to take drugs, he can reverse it. He used to lie, he can reverse it. You used to steal, he could reverse it. You used to commit adultery, he can reverse it. And that's why we're here. We're here because we know that the God that we serve can take you up out of the muck and mire, clay, change your life, set you on solid rock to stay. But we have to be a praying people.